Hello. Since our service was recorded, edited all together and even uploaded online, we've had the sad news of the death of Prince Philip and it would be right for us to not let that pass without paying our respects and praying for the Queen and the rest of the royal family. So I'm going to leave a short space of quiet for us to remember Prince Philip and then I'll pray and then we'll have the rest of our service. Heavenly Father, thank you for the life of Prince Philip and all he gave as a father and husband. Thank you for his service to his country and to his Queen. We pray for Elizabeth, our Queen, and the rest of her family as they mourn. We ask that they may know your comfort and that your presence will be real to them as they recall all their memories of Prince Philip. To the glory of your name. Amen. Good morning to you all. Welcome to another of our Sunday morning church video podcasts. You are very, very welcome. If you're watching or have access to Facebook and you want to post messages to each other or indeed to us, please do so as ever. It's great to see that community building in that forum. Now, we've got a lot of content this morning, so I'm going to get going quite quickly. Uh, a bit later on, we're going to look at a lot of the feedback and the comments that a number of people have shared with us as a result of the time they spent together in the week leading up to Easter. The thing that Pete encouraged many to do as part of what was described as the Emmaus Walk experience. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry, I'll explain in a little bit. But we're going to begin with worship. And we have some guest worship leaders this morning. When you see who they are, you will probably appreciate that what is uh, being shared with you was not recorded specifically for our church, but it was recorded for the church in general to be available as a resource and to encourage us in our worship. So we're going to begin with two familiar songs and then we'll continue after that. Well, hello church. We count it a great privilege to be with you, to worship with you um, and your church. I'm just going to read from John chapter 4, um, 23. Jesus said, But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for their Father is seeking such people to worship him. You know, it came after just a moment when the Samaritan woman said, But don't you Jews say you're meant to worship in the temple? Jesus was saying, it doesn't matter where you worship from, it matters about the state of your heart. That's where worship comes from. That's what the Father's looking for. So today, whether you're in a living room, <laughs> whether you're outside, no matter where you are, we just love the fact that we can worship together. We don't need to be in a church building. We are the church. So let's just choose to worship God despite our circumstances. You know, Jesus didn't say to worship in feelings and circumstance but he said in spirit and in truth. So let's sing together. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you home. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to show Doubts in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, in the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth Wrong. 
God's building his kingdom. Even in this moment, this is a good one to pray for revival. So let's do it Irish style. Let's sing an Irish hymn together. Come say you rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil while we may. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. As we are your church and we need your power. All right, let's go. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger our lives for your our joy and prize to see the captive hearts release the hurt to seek the poor at peace we lay down our lives for heaven's cause 
All right, folks. We're socially distant right now. So we can't do things uh, exactly the way that we would if we were there with you in person. That doesn't mean we're not gonna make a wee effort here to have a little bit of Irish shin diggery. That's a real word, look that up. Why don't you get your arm around whoever you've got near you right now, whoever your lockdown partners are, why don't you just uh, get your arm around them, give them a wee snuggle, and uh, let's celebrate the kingdom of God together. We're still doing this thing, even in the middle of this weird moment. We're still building the kingdom of God. We believe he still has plans for us to prosper us, not to harm us. That's worth celebrating. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty head. Heal our streets and our might have worked out by now we're big believers in joy we believe in the truth of scripture we believe that the joy of the lord is our strength let's lift up that truth over our circumstances right now let's sing it out come on though the tears may fall my song will rise my song will rise to you Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. Though the waters rise, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart, I will praise you, Lord. Singing for joy, come on. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. When I cannot see you with my eyes, let faith arise to you. Though I cannot feel your hand in mine, let faith arise to you. God of mercy and love, I will praise you, Lord. We worship you, I you shine with glory, Lord of life, feel alive with you. In your presence now I come alive, I am alive with you. There is strength when I say it, I will praise you, Lord. Here we go. Then join.
Isn't that fantastic? Just seeing such joy in worship. Wonderful. So I'm going to move on to the thing I talked about at the start, this Emmaus walk thing. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, in the lead up to Easter, Pete was encouraging us, if we wanted to do so, to gather together in groups in two or more, to look at a passage from the book of Luke, the story that happened on the road to a place called Emmaus. And it's a story of Jesus appearing to some of his believers following his resurrection. The encouragement was to look at the passage, to reflect on it and to discuss and to take communion together. And a number of people have done that and have shared with us videos and photos, which I am now going to share with you. Beginning with a video of Hannah Jay very kindly reading the passage itself. It gives the perfect introduction to this. And then you'll see some of the other content. So I hope you get something from this. I hope you enjoy seeing other people. Luke 24, 13 to 35, the voice translation. Picture this, that same day, two other disciples, not of the 11, are traveling the seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. As they walk along, they talk back and forth about all that has transpired during recent days. While they're talking, discussing and conversing, Jesus catches up to them and begins walking with them, but for some reason they don't recognise him. Jesus says, You two seem deeply engrossed in conversation. What are you talking about as you walk along this road? They stop walking and just stand there looking sad. One of them, Cleopas is his name, speaks up. You must be the only visitor in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about what's been going on over these last few days. Jesus says, what are you talking about? It's all about the man named Jesus of Nazareth. He was a mighty prophet who did amazing miracles and preached powerful messages in the sight of God and everyone around. Our chief priests and authorities handed him over to be executed, crucified in fact. We had been hoping that he was the one you know, the one who would liberate all Israel and bring God's promises. Anyway, on top of all this, just this morning, the third day after the execution, some women in our group really shocked us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't see his body anywhere. Then they came back and told us they did see something, a vision of heavenly messengers, and these messengers said that Jesus was alive. Some people in our group went to the tomb to check it out, and just as the women had said it was empty, but they didn't see Jesus. And Jesus said, Come on men, why are you being so foolish? Why are your hearts so sluggish when it comes to believing what the prophets have been saying all along? Didn't it have to be this way? Didn't the anointed one have to experience these sufferings in order to come into his glory?
wasn't that lovely. And there were others as well I know who, who met together and didn't share photos or videos, but did share some feedback. And I'd mention in particular the description Heidi shared of her and her friend Jill, who many of you will know from the village in Bark Green. The two of them going to the Morvans and taking communion on Good Friday morning, looking over the hills. A beautiful imagery and a reminder of God's presence with us. There's going to be some more content coming on after the sermon, but Steve is going to come and talk to us now. Let's pray for Steve as he comes and speaks. Pray for ourselves to be ready to receive what God would want to say to us this morning. So, Father, we thank you for Steve. We thank you for his willingness to step up and to preach this morning. We pray that you would give us hearts and minds ready to receive what you would want to say to us. Help us to hear your voice. And we pray for Steve as he comes and he speaks. May there be blessing. May there be favour. Give us ears to hear, we pray. Amen. Questions. Here's one. How are you today? Here's another one. What are your expectations for the next 20, 25 minutes? Maybe a really key question. When is Steve finally going to get his hair cut? Well, I reassure you that I'm booked in on the 12th of April as soon as the barbers open and normal service will be restored as soon as possible. But as a teacher by trade, questions are central to my job. And training teachers to use the questions effectively is a, a key element in becoming an effective classroom practitioner. Sometimes just getting a trainee teacher to stop gushing out all the information that they've got and to use questions is the first job that has to be done with them. It's very easy to get caught in the trap that thinking that for students to learn something you just tell them everything you know about a subject and uh, t as teachers we can get carried away with our understanding and love of the subject and not actually stop and think where the learners are at and we find where they're at by asking questions. It can be hard work getting your captive audience in front of you to think but questions are good at making people think they engage the learner they require a response they often require some thought uh, they can uncover understanding and they can lead a learner into discovering new understanding so actually uh, delivering a sermon like this especially like this pre-recorded and online it, it doesn't sit well with me I'd much rather have dialogue, uh, so maybe you can use the chat, but unfortunately I can't respond uh, to that n now as I'm speaking, but maybe I'll be online when you're putting your comments and questions in and I can join in. My Bible study notes uh, on Easter Day last week focused on the questions Jesus asked around that time. Uh, to Mary in the garden, it was, why are you crying? to the couple on the road to Emmaus, what are you discussing? When he first appeared to the disciples after the resurrection, why are you troubled? To Peter beside the lake, do you love me? All of those questions Jesus was using to bring that person on to help them, not just directly telling them what to do or giving them a command, but using those questions in a creative way. And I wonder what questions Jesus may be asking us now. Or maybe, if you had the chance, what questions you'd ask him. If this was an all-in service in church, I'd be handing out pieces of paper now and getting you to write down those thoughts, those questions that you think Jesus might be asking or questions that you have for Jesus. And then we discuss them. And it would be anonymous. You wouldn't have to put your name written on a piece of paper. So you could be completely honest with your questions. I'm sure you can imagine what sort of things might be written down. You might even do that in the chat now. Who knows? Somebody may answer for you. We actually did something like this before, a long time ago in an all-in, and I got people into groups and I asked the question, what would Jesus say to us if he walked in now? And uh, it was great. There was, uh, alongside the gem of stop worrying about the colour of that mm -mm 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 carpet, there was the very poignant, what have you done with the gifts that I've given you? 
I, I found that great, really challenging, a question that Jesus might be asking us now. And you just have to look at the Psalms to see the type of questions that people ask God. How long, O oh Lord? Why is there this evil? Why am I suffering in this way? It's okay to ask questions, and I'd say unhealthy not to. Back in the classroom, I like to say to my kids, uh, there's no such thing as a stupid question. And quite often, my lesson has been saved by the child who bravely puts their hand up and says, excuse me, sir, do you mean, or do you want us to do so-and-so? And I realise that actually I haven't made it as clear as I could. And that question saves the lesson, and I'm able to uh, correct it and um, move everybody on. And without that question, others would have been held back, or their learning would have not have been as good. So... There is no such thing as a stupid question or a wrong question with God either. Don't be afraid to ask your loving father a question. I only recently realised that my favourite Bible verse is the 7.11 verse. I call it 7.11, open all hours, because um, it's Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. And it was significant in... Uh, my faith journey and it goes like this if you then though you are evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him now a good parent or teacher values the questions that their children ask it gives them opportunity to talk and to grow together and it's invaluable so how much more will god savor your questions however poor you think their question might be or stupid or an angry question. You just have to keep it real with God. You have to be honest about your heart and mind and it's okay to ask. Now, there's a sense around that we're approaching, if not the beginning of the end of COVID, at least the end of the beginning. We're in a situation with the vaccine rollout and the uh, gradual lifting of restrictions that uh, gives us some hope of returning to what we used to call normal. Uh, but maybe normal is just the way we used to do things and the future will never be like things were before. We can't get too excited though. Scientists are predicting a third wave, not particularly as severe as others, but it's expected around the summer. So we can't get our hopes up too much. We still have to be careful. But with the hope that we can foresee an end what questions are there around us and church? There's lots of questions, I guess, uh, like the one that is, what just happened? What have the last 12 months been about? We reflect on the time in lockdown and what we have and haven't been able to do. A more important question, though, is what happens now? And maybe even a dangerous question is, well, what do we want? Our faith and how we work that out has been changed, uh, moulded by our daily and weekly routines having to adjust to the impact of the pandemic. It's given us all food for thought. Some of it has been and continues to be challenging. Some of it has been a relief as the compulsion or expectation to do certain things in certain ways have been removed. Look at how uh, working from home has been a benefit for some. So although I might be clear on what I want going forward, what things from the old normal I can easily live without, and what I'd like to restore, and what things from the new normal I like and I don't want to lose, I have to stop and ask the most important question. What does God want? If I think about going forward, I'm very conscious that our expression of faith is tied up in a lot of things that we can get a little bit muddled up with and confused with. I'll try and give a specific example, and it's only given as an example, uh, and don't read too much into it, please. But one of the things I've really valued uh, in our church, in the old normal, has been the quality of our music and worship, and the input of the musicians and the worship leaders who create an environment that I can be in, that I'm comfortable in, that I can enjoy, and that I can feel I'm responding to my God in. Um, but I've had to ask myself, is that what I go to church for? Am I loving the songs or, the, or, the, or and not the saviour? Am I caught up in just the music? Or is this my act of true worship? 
I'm sure it's a combination of the two, but it's a good question to ask in the sense that it's making me evaluate what I do and consider not just doing something for the sake of doing it. I'm sure that when we return to church, we'll at least start with familiar patterns and styles. I'm not suggesting a wholesale re-evaluation of everything we do, but all our experiences of the last 12 months will feed into the whole and I'm certain that some things will be different. One of the factors will be us and decisions we've made about our time and energy and where our priorities lie and how we individually express our faith. And so I think it's important we ensure that whatever we decide, going forward, we hold on to three central things. And they're three things that we're very familiar with and they're generally referred to as the greatest commandment, the second greatest commandment, and the third, no, not the third greatest commandment, there wasn't a third greatest commandment, but the great commission. The greatest commandment, the second greatest commandment, and the great commission. These three central things will help us as we go forward and we have to make decisions about what we do and don't do. What we continue with, what we stop doing, what we start doing, what we continue to do. They will help us answer uh, the question, what does God want? So let's hear the story of the greatest commandment. I've chosen to read it uh, from Mark rather than Matthew. It's longer in Mark. I think it gives it a bit more context. It's Mark chapter 12, if you want to look it up, and it starts uh, verse 28, a bit of a walk the way into the chapter. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbour as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. So on the theme of questions, I wondered what was behind the teacher of the law's initial question. Was it a genuine inquiry? Did he not know what the greatest commandment was? Or was he testing Jesus? Was he teasing something out from Jesus? I think it's more likely to be the latter, testing or challenging Jesus, drawing something out, and maybe not in a cruel way to trip him up, but just to find out if they were thinking the same thoughts. I think it's more likely the latter, because this guy was a professional, a teacher of the law, and he would have been expected to have evaluated and thought about uh, the commandments and all the laws an awful lot. So I'm sure he would have come to some sort of conclusion himself. And after Jesus answers, the guy congratulates him. He doesn't go, hmm, okay, make me think. He goes, no, yes, you're right. So, without trying to take this apart too much, I imagine that the exchange to have actually been between two like minds. The teacher had heard Jesus discussing all sorts of areas of life already, marriage, taxes, the national leadership. It's all there in Mark 12. And so the teacher approaches Jesus to check him out. He wants to know if this bloke who is spouting out on all manner of topics is on the same page as he is. And lo and behold, he is. Number one priority, love God with all of yourself, your whole life and your whole being. Now I learned a bit about this whilst researching for the sermon. And rather than just repeating what someone else has already done, I'd encourage you to head on over to the Bible Project online, bibleproject.com. I'll put the link on the screen and in the chat if I'm on the chat. They've done a great little series of half a dozen or so four or five minute videos to explain the Shema. And the Shema is a daily prayer that Jews have used for thousands of years and it's what Jesus is quoting when he answers this question and says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And I'll tell you to head over there because this is not a time to start nitpicking about 
um, the difference between mind, soul and heart and where the mind stops and the heart begins. Um, the Bible projects have put out a really good explanation that the verse is simply saying, give God all of yourself, everything about you and everything about your living. It's the same sort of attitude that Paul is expressing when he writes about us offering ourselves as a living sacrifice. That's in Romans 12, if you want to look it up, if you're curious. Number one priority, love God with all of yourself, your whole life and your whole being. And then there's these two little riders that these two guys in their little law of God loving that they're having, they add on to this. Jesus adds immediately that the second greatest commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. And I'll come to that a bit later. Uh, the teacher also adds that loving God with all of yourself, your whole life and your whole being is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And that's where I think there's some learning to be had for myself at least. Offerings and sacrifices were part of the law. They went wrong, but they had to hang off the number one priority, which was loving God with all of yourself, your whole life and your whole being. If you're making your sacrifice and your offering, and it's not because it's an expression that you are loving God with your whole life and being, then don't bother. Don't just go through the motions. Whatever you do, do it because you love God. And so clearly this helps me in my thinking about worship and music, as I described earlier. I must make sure that what I am doing and singing is because I'm offering God myself and I don't actually need music to do that. And actually shutting up and just having a humble and contrite heart might be a far better offering sometimes. I shouldn't need music to worship. But that's not to say that it isn't a really beautiful and useful gift that God has given us in allowing us to express love for him and remind ourselves, each other, of his love and his promises to us. Now, and I don't want to get too hung up on that. It, it was only an illustration from a personal point of view, but you could see how it might apply to other things, the things that we do, that doing church things that we do might be in need of an evaluation. One of the expressions that's come out of our time with COVID is that we ought to focus on being the church rather than doing church. We've had the chance to reflect and think about many things and we've been asking that question is this something i'm doing for the sake of just doing it or is it part of my living sacrifice to god and sacrifice is hurt so i think we need to be careful looking at things and saying well during lockdown i love that i didn't have to do so and so anymore and so i'd rather we didn't do that again when in fact choosing to do whatever so-and-so is might just be part of your loving God with all of yourself, your whole life and your whole being, even if it hurts. The comedian Milton Jones has a joke about churches. <clears throat> he says people sometimes think churches are like helicopters. They're afraid of being sucked in by the rotors. Going back to church naturally means that there'll be jobs to do and organize. The rotors will return. <coughs> the return of the rotors. Well, actually, they, they haven't gone away. There'll still be the need for doing things on a regular basis, like kids' church and youth church and worship leading and a few of the background jobs to make all this happen, this video now. It's been a small number of folk that have been involved, but that number has been growing, and that's really good to see. People stepping up when they've been asked to, well, could you try this? Could you do this? And it, that's good. That's good. I've actually even created a new rotor. An extra rotor? Have you noticed? Someone on the door online uh, to welcome people in the chat in Facebook. If you've logged in, I hope you've noticed that. Um, maybe you've been able to spot what they're doing or who it is. Uh, maybe you can see who it is this week. It's going to be interesting to see what we think we need as a rotor still and who will step up we may well be limited by the people available. I'd like to suggest that whatever the rota, no one is on it more than once a month, or even better, only once every half term. Now that will require quite a few people to step up, won't it? So maybe at least once a month. And we need to be aware of uh, the multiple rota syndrome. You know, people who are on one rota one week and then another rota the next week and another rota the next week. Um, it shouldn't be that every time you turn up for church, you have a job to do. Back in the old normal, I was really grateful uh, for Arthur, Matt and Stu stepping up to help with the PA and recording the sermon. 
it meant that I could actually get out from behind that desk and at least two or three times a month I could just uh, turn up, sit in the congregation without a responsibility and worship and focus on the teaching. Not that I wouldn't do the jobs that I could do because of my gifting, but there are times when I just need to receive. And it's the same for all of us. There are times when we can give with our gifts and there are times when we need to receive. And I think there's going to be some interesting conversations as we move forward. And as long as we speak with each other in grace, with empathy, we'll be fine as we explore the answer to the question, what does God want? And maybe it might be, what might the rotors be that God wants us to have? Now, it might seem I've gone a, a bit round the houses on that, but I'm trying to look at how we answer the question, what does God want? And as we move forward, I said there were three central things, and I've looked to the first, the greatest commandment, and I said I'd come back to the rider that Jesus added, which was what he said was the second greatest. Jesus tied these two together, love God and love other people, in the same breath. The guide asked what is the greatest commandment, singular, and Jesus gave an answer with two, you know, and the second is. You know, there's an illustration in the cross, isn't there? That uh, Once the vertical is in place, the horizontal can be where it should be. If you don't have the vertical, you, you can't have the horizontal. You won't have a cross. It'll just be two pieces of wood on the floor. Get your relationship, the vertical, with God right first, and then you can relate to others, the horizontal, as you should. So, going forward... Recognising that our number one priority is to love God with all of ourselves, our whole lives and our whole being, our second priority is going to be loving other people. Now I might have some pretty clear ideas of how I want to love God and how I want my church to be, but if we're going to be loving others as ourselves, that means listening to and accounting for how others want to love God and others want church to be. I might not be too good at that sometimes, but it's that grace and empathy business again. Uh, but that's almost an aside, and by that I mean, although taking account of the opinions of each other with grace and empathy as we move forward is important, I fully believe Jesus added this extra bit to the greatest commandment because he wanted us to be not only humbly loving to those in the church family, but those beyond it too. And that was the real focus of it. So I'd like to add on the third point, that I mentioned earlier. We've had the two greatest commandments and the third point is the greatest commission, the great commission, which links naturally to loving other people. The great commission is recorded in at the end, right at the end of Matthew's gospel. So you can find it quite easy, chapter 28. I'll just read it to you now. Then Jesus said to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Whatever we do as a church going forward, we have to see it as an outward facing organization. We are not to be a holy huddle. Our church, our small groups, and ourselves even giveth the greatest commandment, love God with all yourself, your whole life, and your whole being. We need to have a fixed item on whatever agenda we have, and that item is reaching out to and meeting the needs of and praying for others outside of the church. Now, we do pretty well as a church in this area because we are very generous to the mission work we support. But I just want to make sure that as we go forward and look at how church is to be, we do not forget that the church exists as much for others as for ourselves. The, the church is God's vehicle for growing his kingdom. In this world, now, making disciples and we are his co-workers. Maybe we just need a simple question in our minds. How do we make our church open and welcoming to those outside of it? What could we do with, say, the layout of our foyer, or the layout of our website, or the way we welcome a newcomer, or the times when we're open for business, or whether we have services online or not? Now don't worry, that's not my suggested agenda for the next church meeting. I think there's a lot we do well as a church, 
but it won't hurt to think about these things, to re-examine things, to just check that we are a truly outward-facing church with no unnecessary barriers to others joining us. As freedoms are lifted, there's the opportunity to think about how we, as a church, reach out into the communities around each of us, each of us on our own front line. I hope the chats and interviews that have been part of the online services have helped you pray for those people and in the situations that they are in. And I hope that we can continue those chats, whether we are doing them online or whether we're doing them back in the building. So eventually we end up going around the whole church family and then we can start again because we are all witnesses and we all need the support and care of each other. As we think about reaching out to other people, maybe there are questions we can ask ourselves like, how can I get my friend to be or want to be a disciple of Jesus? How can I get them along to my small group? What could my small group do that would allow them to engage with it? What need is there out there that people outside of the church have that we could meet? We could go and meet their need and draw them in. Or how do I or how do we communicate to the people outside the church the positives of discipleship? Oh, those questions might just be a bit narrow. I thought of them off the top of my head and there are probably others and better ones, but I hope you get my drift on this and I hope that together with grace and empathy we can move forward and as a church get as close as possible to what God wants. And I'd state, having looked at those three central things, that what God wants is a church that encourages and enables us to worship God with all of ourselves, our whole lives and our whole being. He wants us to be a people that truly love others as ourselves and he wants us to be a church that is serious about growing disciples and extending God's kingdom an outward facing church and whatever we decide about the future as long as those three things are true then we're okay and as a little afterthought what's really great is something inside the Great Commission which was pointed out to me a long time ago and I wonder if it's been pointed out to you or you've seen it yourself. It's an almost conditional promise that Jesus makes to us. It's the go and lo. Now what I read out to you before was I think NIV. In the King James Version the Great Commission goes like this, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you and lo I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Go and lo. Go into all the world, and lo, I am with you always. It's not quite explicitly conditional, but the command to go into all the world comes first, and then that is followed by Jesus' promise to be with us always. Go into the world, and lo, you will find me. If we want to know God at work in our lives, in our church, if we want a greater sense of his presence, then it's in going, it's reaching out, that we're going to find him. If we want to know what God wants, if we want a better, closer relationship with him, then we need this priority of making disciples and building the kingdom. And as we do that, we will find God with us and we will probably be very close to knowing what God wants. Now, there are a lot of unknowns going forward. We might feel fearful and uncertain about what we don't know and what will be different and what we may have lost, what we may never get back. But we can be clear of God's promises and his desire and priorities for us and his world. Love him, love others, make disciples and build his kingdom. Amen. Thank you, Steve. We're just gonna continue in prayer for just a few moments before Sarah's then going to come and share her own Easter walk thoughts before we finally conclude with another song just to con- conclude the service. But let's just start in prayer. And I do recognise that as we pray together, there are many who are continuing to struggle in so many ways. With the separation still continuing, notwithstanding lockdown, not being quite as it was before. So much uncertainty as to what the future may hold in a personal life, in church life, in in work life, whatever it may be. We need to submit 
and place our trust in God, which is very much what Sarah will share with us in a moment or two. So let's just pray. Father, we thank you that you know us so deeply and so fully. There is nothing hidden from you. Help us to find patience and trust in our faith as we wait for those of us who are struggling in whatever way or shape it may be, whether that be emotional or spiritual or physical, we pray that you would come and you would meet with us. We pray for healing, we pray for the miraculous, but we also pray for hope and joy and patience and peace, all those gifts that you give to us. I'd encourage each of you to just pray in your own mind for those who are on your heart, whether that be yourself, your family, or somebody else. But Father, we pray all these things knowing that you hear. And that we pray them in the name of Jesus, knowing that he comes to intercede for us before you. Thank you that you are good, and that our hope is in you. Amen. Hello, it's Easter Saturday and I've just got back from a walk to the post office, quite a long walk, so I had some time to think and I was thinking about the Easter weekend and how we can find parallels in our own lives. I started thinking first about Good Friday and Jesus saying, not my will but yours and I was reminded that there are times when we have to not do what we want to do but we have to submit and do something that we don't really want to do or that's hard but we have to do it um, with God's help and then I was thinking about Easter Saturday and how difficult that must have been for the disciples who had had their hopes and dreams smashed and didn't really know what to think, didn't know, I guess, whether there was hope or no hope. And how many times in our lives we're in that situation of waiting, of hoping a little, but not knowing how long this is going to go on for, and feeling often maybe depressed and disappointed. But actually we need to keep trusting in God at those times and handing over ourselves and those that we love and are praying for and trusting that he has not forgotten and that he will see his promises through it for us. And then of course Easter Sunday when those promises come, come through and the resurrection and that love poured down onto us and that power and that we need to keep trusting and hoping for that resurrection day um, in our lives and in the lives of those that we love and care for. That day is coming, just hold on. I've carried a You saw my condition 
your son for redemption the price for my heart and I don't have a contest for that kind of love I don't understand oh I can't comprehend but all I know is I need you I run So 